Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you and worship you as our God and our Savior. We thank you, Father, as always, for your great love for us, for your desire to know us, for your desire to bring us into your presence in the death of Jesus so we can know you, experience you, walk with you, talk with you, and just have the awesomeness of being with you. I pray you will draw us to you this morning, speak to us, encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Paul closes the teaching part of the letter with two commandments. He tells them to be persistent in prayer and to conduct yourself wisely. So he ends his letter before he gives all the parting greetings in chapter in verse 7 and following with two commands. That's going to be our focus this morning is the two commands. Beginning in verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well, then God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have been imprisoned. That I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward others, toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So the first command is devote yourself to prayer, verse 2. Um, and that word devote, maybe should, we should enlarge on that somewhat. Be intently engaged in. Stay close to, persistent in. Attend to constantly. And that's the idea. <clears throat> in the Greek world outside the Bible, that's how the word is used primarily. It's emphasizing that persistence. Stay close to. You're, it's not just a passing thing. It's something you are... You are striving to do, intentionally doing, and doing it persistently. So, he's commanding his readers to invest themselves in prayer. Does this mean we live in a prayer closet and never go anywhere? No. But it does mean we are in Christ. Christ is in us. Wherever I am, he is there also. It is an awareness of the reality. I am always in the presence of God. And I've had that attitude of that ongoing conversation. If you travel with someone in the car, you're with them the whole time, and you will talk off and on throughout the drive. Well, in life, it's somewhat similar. I'm always with God. He's always with me, and I'm always aware of that fact, and my attitude is that fact. I'm always in, in speaking distance with God, if you will. So, devote yourself to prayer. Be persistent in prayer. Well, the obvious question becomes, what is prayer? I mean, he tell me to do this almost all the time, nonstop. What is prayer? If I were to ask people to define prayer, we may get multiple different answers. Prayer is a term that's used in most every religion, Muslim, Hindu, Catholic, everything uses the term prayer, uh, prayers to their God. So what is prayer? You start to think about what is prayer. Well, most people might associate prayer with the blessing before you eat. And that's the end of it. Or maybe prayer is, if you have a need, you ask God to take care of it. That's prayer. Prayer is asking God to intervene. Prayer is giving God a list of things that I want him to take care of. Either somebody else's problem or my problem, something along those lines. I saw a church sign once off I-10 that said, Prayer is a wish cast toward heaven. I'd like to meet that pastor and slap him. <laughs> and what a, a horrible statement to make about prayer That's, no we're not wishing for anything but think about it when we think about the term prayer is it not most often associated with a list of things we're asking God to do and take care of it's all about so and so is sick be with them heal them so-and-so has financial needs, help them find solutions, provide for them. The storm just went through, pray for those affected, by all means do. We have a lunch coming up, by all means pray for God's will be done. But we associate prayer often with lists of needs that we're going to ask God to take care of. So we think about praying all the time, so I take my prayer list wherever I go and I'm always praying through my prayer list. That's what Paul's saying. No, because in reality, that's a very small part of what prayer is. 
Yes, it's praying for God to intercede, but that's not the primary function of prayer. That's a small part of what prayer is. Unfortunately, I think in our culture, though, that is all people associate prayer with, is asking God to fix things. Going through the fixer to get it fixed so everything will be all right. That's a small part of what prayer is. So what is prayer? <laughs> prayer is a personal, intimate conversation with God. Or you think about prayer when it's done in public. Some folks pray in the King James language. So you think prayer is this formal event where you have to be speak formally and use big words and whatever else. And that's not what prayer is. 95% of prayer or more is your personal quiet time alone with God. It is that personal time you spend alone with Him. You've heard me say before, prayer is your relationship with God. It's not always going and asking Him to intervene. It's sitting on your back porch and talking with God about the sunset or the sound the wind makes of the pine tree. It's simply having a conversation with God. It may include, I'm hurting here, help me, yes. It may include, my marriage is just not happy anymore, help me, yes. But prayer is 95% or more just me being in the presence of God. That is God's desire for you. God wants you to come to your back porch, your prayer closet, whatever, and sit there with him. God wants you to make time to do nothing but be with him. He so wants that to happen, he nailed his son Jesus to the cross to make that happen. Without Jesus, I am a sinner, and that sin bearer separates me from God. Through his death on the cross, he removed that sin barrier. And when I come to him, he removes my sin. He cleanses me, purges me, makes me holy like he is holy, righteous like he is righteous. And now I am able to come literally into the presence of God and sit there with him. In his presence, face to face. That's God's intent. What is the purpose of man? That is the purpose of man, to know God, to be with God. To spend time with God. To invest your life with God. Everything that God has done from day one has been to bring Adam and Eve and then their descendants, us, into his presence to enjoy him. Think about that for a minute. We are able to enter the presence of God Almighty. Sit down and talk with him like we do with each other. Don't forget he's God. The reverence should still be there. So when Jesus said pray, he said pray like this. Our Father, not our great God Almighty, our Father. It's a personal, intimate connection and relationship. That's what prayer is. That's what God's intent is for prayer. It's for us to be with him, walk with him, talk with him, experience his presence. That's everything. All of creation was designed for us to be in the presence of God. All of eternity is designed for us to be in the presence of God. He wants your company. Think for a minute. Who on earth would you really, really like to go be able to sit down and talk to? Touch whips? I hope not. Just thought I'd throw that out there. How about you, Jack? Touch whips? Right? If you could go sit down with anybody on the planet, who would it be? I like to sit down with Vladimir Putin. I think that would be kind of interesting. Just the conversation, if that could happen, it would be interesting. What's, what are you thinking here, Vladimir? What's going on? That would be, be kind of interesting. Uh, I always like to meet George W. Bush because I respected him as a believer with what he went through in the White House. That would be, be an interesting conversation. About his faith. I don't care about that politics stuff. But about his faith. Um, who would you have to sit down with and talk to? And then think, is it possible? Well, no. I never said I talked to Putin or Bush or for that matter, anybody. Why? Because I'm a nobody. They have no time for me. I have no value to them whatsoever. I am useless for 99.99% of all the population. They have no value in me. They care about me. They would invite me to, to wash their front door. No, I am, I am totally useless to most everybody on the planet. But the one who created the planet was all-powerful, 
God, he looks forward to me coming to spend time with him. Think about that for a minute. Who looks forward to spending time with you? God so wants to spend time with you, he sacrificed Jesus on the cross to make that happen. That is prayer. Paul is saying, be diligent, persistent in your prayer life. So what Paul is saying, this command is, be diligent, be persistent in your relationship with God the Father made possible in Jesus. That's a great command to close with. Spend time with God. God has made it possible for you, nobody, to be important to him and to sit on your back porch, front porch, prayer works for you, and be alone with him. That's the point Paul's making. Be diligent in your prayer life. Be diligent in your relationship with God. But what greater statement to make to any believer as far as a command or encouragement? Man, spend more time with God. Grow that relationship. He continues in verse 2, keeping alert in it. I am always in the presence of God. Live like it. I'm always in the presence of God. Think like it. I would never curse out loud. But do I curse in my head? Who's in my head with me? God. Why would I only curse in front of God? That makes no sense. Live like it. Think like it. I'm always in the presence of God. Keeping alert in the fact that I'm always in a state of prayer with God. Next statement, with thanksgiving. An attitude of thanksgiving regards to the circumstances is trust in God. Paul is stating the obvious. If I am persistent in prayer, I am aware of God and that he is in control. And no matter what's happening around me or globally, God is God. There is no other. And he's in control. Politicians may think they are, they are not. Governors may think they are, they are not. God is in control. It's hard to panic when I'm standing in God's presence. Is it not? So if I am actively persistent in my prayer life, my relationship with God, it's going to be real hard for me to panic about anything. Uh, and I know most things are maybe a few seconds of, oh my. But then if I'm in that state of prayer, it's like, oh my, oh wow. What's God going to do with this? Even though it might be painful or shocking. So it always adds to the thanksgiving, understanding, acknowledging God's got this. He's in control. So what does this mean for you and I? It means this: say, my job is lousy. My neighbors are awful. My marriage it sucks. My kids are lousy. Uh, whatever it means for me, if I am persistent in my prayer time and in my prayer life, and I'm seeking to be in God's presence, he will change me. You with me? Your spouse is lousy. Take it to God, and he will change you. Because you're the one going to him. Yes, you pray, speak to my spouse as well, but God's going to work on you in your prayer time. Your job is lousy. Take it to God. He will change you. Politics are destroying this country. Take it to God. He will change you. You see, we began prayer idea with go to God, ask Him to intervene and change what we're requesting Him to do. But in reality, when I go to God and invest my time with Him, He's probably going to start with changing me, regardless of what my prayer request is. He'll begin by changing my heart, my attitude, my outlook. And think about it. If you're praying, well, marriage is a great example about your marriage. God, please tell her What's going on? <laughs> or him, whatever. Is it the better thought God tell me? What, what am I supposed to be doing in this situation? How do I respond in this situation? So if I'm diligent in my prayer life, no matter what I bring before God or I'm experiencing in life, God is there and he's going to work with me, through me, in me to lead me through it as he wants me to experience it. Basic. Paul then asked, talking about prayer, <clears throat> to pray for him. Paul's prayer request. Note, while Paul makes his prayer request, he is in prison waiting to see Nero, which is not a good thing because Nero hates Christians. He, he burned them to keep his garden lit at night. Uh, he was an awful emperor. So Paul's waiting to see Nero in prison. So his prayer request is that I escape. 
No. His prayer request is that God will open a door, not for escape, but for the word, so that we may speak Christ. Paul wants more opportunity to share Jesus with those around him. He wants the door open for the gospel to be preached, not for him to get out of jail. Interesting play on words on Paul's part. No? Paul, in prison, asked for an opportunity to share Jesus, not freedom. Paul requests of this because he knows he is there because God put him there. Paul knows that God wants him to speak before the emperor of Rome, the gospel of Jesus. Verse 4, his request, his request continues, that I make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Paul prays for clarity of speech and thought. Paul knows the gospel. He knows what Jesus did in his life. He has his story with Jesus. Now he's praying for clarity and how to present that truth of Jesus and how Jesus changed his life. Many people I hear say, I wish I knew more about God so I could better share the gospel. Wrong statement. The statement should be what Paul just said. Pray that I had clarity to speak what I already know about Jesus. You can read your Bible anytime you want to learn more about Jesus. What we need is clarity in how to communicate that truth we know and we live and we experience in our salvation. So Paul prays for clarity in speech. And to be honest with you, when I pray for you, if there are specific things you've mentioned, I'll pray for that. But my prayer is that you have opportunity and ability to share the gospel where God's put you. Because wherever you are, you're the front line of the gospel presentation to those around you. And I pray that God will clearly give you wisdom and discernment in how and when to speak his truth. That is my prayer request for you. Along with anything else you may mention or ask for. The last commandment. Conduct yourselves verses 5 through 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom Toward others. Think before you act or react. The what would Jesus do is not a bad thought. How do I present Jesus' situation is also a good thought. Do I need to respond or not respond? Do I need to speak or not speak? With wisdom toward others. And I think the older I get, the thought I have the most now is, do I need to respond? They're wrong. Do I need to tell them that? Do I need to correct them? Do I need to say anything? Do I need to let them know they hurt my feelings? Or just eat it and go on? How can I best communicate Jesus in what's happening? With wisdom toward others. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward others. And it probably is, most of the time, the best response is, shut up and sit down. Making the most of the opportunity, God put you in that situation for a reason. And that reason is Jesus. Wherever I am, any time of day, God has put me there. And the primary reason I am there is for Him, His purpose, His glory, either in me or for me sharing Christ with those around me. Make the most of the opportunity in representing Jesus. Faith Coincidence, chance, none of that really exists. God is in control, and he will put us where he wants us for our good and for his good and his glory and for us to be a testimony for him. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Grace is defined by Jesus. His death on the cross, this is grace. Our speech should have the same grace, forgiveness, love, and mercy as Jesus had on the cross. Our words can set or change circumstances. If I respond in grace, it should have a positive effect. May not, but more likely it will. The term season with salt, season the perfect tense, is just say to be. So salt preserves, adds flavor. That should be our words to others. Salt is obvious. If, you, if salt's missing, it's obvious. Fries with no salt are bland. Popcorn with no salt is paper. It's gross. If we leave off the seasoning of salt, they're going to know that. That's the point. They'll miss the grace part of our statement or the love or our concern. All they will see is the bland part or the judgment. So seasoning with salt is a great word picture. Um, it makes a difference when we have the grace presented in the correct way. Because I can't present grace judgmentally. It ceases to be grace, but it started that way. 
So you will know how to respond to each person. Uh, the word know perfect tense also as believers, we know how to respond already. We always know how to respond. It's in love. It's in grace. It's in mercy. It's in forgiveness. Because that is Jesus who we represent. God put us where we are for an opportunity to share Jesus. Make the most of the opportunity. Wherever you are, whatever's going on, make the most of the opportunity to share Jesus. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will draw us to you, open our eyes to the reality that you are God, there is no other, and give us, Father, wisdom and discernment and being your people where you placed us to represent you. And I pray, Father, we will faithfully look for opportunity to share Jesus, to share our story that you put in us in Jesus, to share our love for you, Father, and your love for us with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.